In this month's edition of Edutainment, journalist and writer John Carlin on South Africa, politics and football, and me, Philip Quarterman, on the city of Segovia. With 30 years' experience across more than 40 countries, John Carlin is both a courageous journalist and a gifted writer. His 2008 book, Playing the Enemy, tells the story of Nelson Mandela's part in the 1995 Rugby World Cup held in post-apartheid South Africa. The book was later filmed by Warner Brothers. The film was released in 2009 as Invictus, starring Morgan Freeman and Matt Damon, and directed by Clint Eastwood. What was the significance of the 1995 Rugby World Cup? Well, I think the, the case of 1995 South Africa was very, very exceptional. The Springboks, the South African national team, were for the majority of the population one of the more potent symbols of, of racial oppression. And so there was a far greater political content to the game in itself. And, and Mandela's genius was to transform this symbol of, um, of political division and oppression into an instrument of reconciliation and unity. So this was, you know, it was a very particular moment in South African history. It was a very particular sport that happened to have this political burden that it carried. And I'm not sure that you can actually, you're gonna to find too many examples where that, where that is replicated. How much did Mandela gamble that South Africa would win the 1995 Rugby World Cup? Oh, I don't think he was taking such a big gamble. It, it was, it was, it was, I mean, once you got to the actual game itself, once you got to the final of the Rugby World Cup, the morning of the game, with no one knowing what the outcome was going to be, he couldn't lose. The important thing was that on that morning, with very, very few exceptions, I think, the great bulk of, of South Africans, black and white, were united in a common cause. They actually wanted the Springboks to win which might seem banal and, you know, and ordinary in some other country, but in South Africa, to have you know, the majority of black people wanting a Springbok team to win was, as they say in South Africa, a hell of a thing. It was probably the first time since the arrival of the first white settlers in what we now call South Africa in 1652 that the entirety, the entirety of the population actually shared one goal. So that in itself was great, so that even if South Africa had lost, the sense of disappointment would have been a shared emotion, which in its own way would have been a unifying thing. Obviously, the fact that South Africa won raised the whole sort of euphoria and decibel levels um, to a much higher pitch and, uh, and made the whole thing a much more lasting um, monument. Uh, had South Africa lost that game, I probably wouldn't have written a book about that. <laughs> How powerful is sport as a political instrument? Probably the potential to transform the emotion that sport generates into political outcomes is something that has not been exploited to the full so far um, by political leaders. And I suspect that it's quite a dangerous instrument. Um, it can be used for good if you're lucky and the leader of the day happens to be Nelson Mandela, but in the hands of tyrants or political opportunists, uh, it can be a very dangerous thing because the, the, the activity of watching sport as a spectator and really rooting for one particular team, or player for that matter, is an activity which presupposes a certain suspension of the rational faculties and you enter into kind of hyper emotional, tribal terrain. And, uh, and those kind of emotions can be channeled in, in dangerous ways. I think in, in the case of the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin, Hitler used that as an, in an attempt to promote his idea of Aryan racial superiority, um, you know, to sort of help pave the way for the extermination of the Jews, for example. And in the case of Argentina in 1978, there was a particularly appalling and brutal uh, military regime with sort of somewhat Nazi overtones who used the 1978 World Cup in Argentina uh, as a means also of rallying support behind them and probably perpetuating their, their, their permanence and power beyond what it might otherwise have been the case. So I think that there's some powerful emotions there that sport unleashes. And um, probably, I would say, on balance, 
probably best that the politicians steered clear of it altogether because I think that there are, there are possible dangers there. Your thoughts on the FIFA World Cup 2010? Well, I think the South African and 10 FIFA World Cup is a very different political beast from the 1995 Rugby World Cup. In 1995, South Africa was in a very different political moment. Um, Mandela had been in power for barely one year. The democracy was young, fragile, and somewhat threatened. And the, the urgent imperative then was to cement the foundations of the new country, to reconcile black and white people after centuries of division, and to try and create a united country. These are not, as far as I see anyway, the priorities today. I think that South Africa is as united a country as any other country that I know. Um, sure, there are sometimes tensions between black and white people, but I think in the main, for the vast majority of people in South Africa, uh, that is not really much of an issue. I think black and white people get on in a respectful and cordial way, by and large. And there are other far more pressing issues and far less exciting issues than there used to be in South Africa in 1995. South Africa is a country whose problems are, in a way, banal, in the sense that they're shared by dozens, if not scores, of other countries worldwide. It's the economy. It's combating poverty, it's combating crime, it's combating corruption, it's building up the public education system. So the Football World Cup, I don't think the Football World Cup in South Africa is going to be significantly different from what it would be if it were held, say, in a country like Mexico or Brazil. It may have economic benefits, with luck it will, greater investment, uh, an infrastructure that has a lasting benefit for the country as a whole. But I think, above all, the only thing we can say for sure is that this World Cup is going to make South Africans of all colours and creeds uh, happy and proud. The beautiful Castilian town of Segovia, UNESCO World Heritage Site and home of IE University. There are guidebooks and Wikipedia articles aplenty to help you discover this ancient city, but in this edition of Edutainment, we've distilled this information while attempting to avoid the obvious into a single and somewhat irreverent list. Segovia, top five facts. At number five, the Romans. The most iconic feature of this historical city is a 2,000 year old Roman aqueduct. It certainly is a marvel of engineering as the whole thing stands without any mortar. While the experts say it's a first or second century construction and undoubtedly Roman, local legend would have us believe otherwise. The two alternative building contractors are Hercules, he of the twelve labours, and the devil himself. The devil legend has it that a young girl, understandably tired of carrying water from the well, sold her soul to the devil in exchange for a labour-saving water delivery device. The devil, accepting the challenge, worked throughout the night to raise the aqueduct. The girl, however, repenting of her evil bargain, prayed to God for salvation. God took pity on the poor child and caused the sun to rise early, leaving the devil unable to fulfil his contractual obligations. With only one stone left to place, the girl's soul was saved. The aqueduct was built and they all lived happily ever after. Except for the devil, of course. At number four, Gothicism. Well, Gothic architecture. The majestic cathedral. Building work began in 1525, making this the last Gothic cathedral in Europe. It wasn't sanctified, however, until 1768. Standing at 88 metres tall, and nicknamed the Queen of the Cathedrals, it was once taller than it is now, but lost a few metres in 1614 when it was struck by lightning. Following the Gothic theme, we have the Alcázar, the last castle built in Gothic Europe. It was in fact constructed over several centuries, but the final design owes much to Felipe II, Philip II, the late 16th century King of Spain. Inspired by the roof architecture of Northern Europe, Felipe's design is considered by some to be his grand folly. This is perhaps a little unfair in retrospect, as it is the most photographed castle in Spain. With a population of over 56,000 and standing at a kilometre above sea level, the city has the slightly odd nickname of the Stone Ship. The Alcazar is the prow, and the cathedral the mast. At number three, the New World. As well as fanciful maritime associations, Segovia also boasts royal connections. San Miguel Church, here in Plata Mayor, was the site of Ferdinand II and Isabella I's sponsorship of Christopher Columbus's 1492 voyage to the New World. It was also the site of Isabella's coronation. The monarchs promised 10,000 pieces of silver to the member of the expedition who sighted land first. Although the lookout, Rodrigo Triano, was the first to see the New World's coast, Columbus said otherwise and claimed the 10,000 pieces of silver for himself. At number two, food. 
As any visitor to the Iberian Peninsula will know, Spain is a gastrophile's delight, and Segovia is no exception. The city's signature dish is not one for the vegetarians. Cochinillo is suckling pig roasted and served whole. It was made famous by local chef extraordinaire Candido Lopez Sanz, known locally as Mesonero Mayor de Castilla, which roughly translates as the highest innkeeper in Castile. Senor Lopez Sanz even has a street named after him. His family restaurant is still going and is run by his son, who now performs the traditional cutting of the pig with a plate. It's to show how tender the meat is. And number one, my personal favorite, parties. After the food comes the fun of the festivals, and the festival of Santa Agueda, which is held on the Sunday closest to the 5th of February, is one of the most colorful in Segovia. Santa Agueda is the patron saint of Taramarala, and also the patron saint of Sicily. She's also the patron saint of midwives, wet nurses, earthquakes, fires, and eruptions of Mount Etna. Centuries ago, during the Christian reconquest of Spain, the Moors held the Alcázar the local women executing a cunning plan dressed in their finest clothes and distracted the guards by dancing for them while the men snuck in to attack. The plan failed, the women were captured and the leader had her breast cut off, the same fate that was suffered by Santa Agueda. The three-day festival began in 1227. Only married and widowed women participate in the traditional dances wearing traditional dress. A separate, more modern aspect of the festival revolves around burning an effigy of a man to ridicule masculine power. Of course, Segovia has much more to offer than these five facts, but nevertheless, we hope we've given you a taste of the richness of this historic city. Join us again next time for another edition of Edutainment. <laughs>